We are continuing on considerations of LTI systems. And in this uh, lecture, we're going to talk about uh, solutions to LTI systems and really constructing them in the sense of uh, building models that are differential equations based. You can either differential or difference equations, but we'll focus mostly on the continuous case where we think about linear constant coefficient differential equations, the solution techniques we need for that, because they become the basis of our understanding of how to construct fundamental, rep fundamental responses to kicks in our system and then build ultimately LTI solutions that are useful for us in, in applications and in signal processing. So um, we're going to think about LTI systems and the thing we're going to start with now is thinking about solutions to differential equations. Now differential equations can generically be written sort of in this form here which is some function dy dt equals some f. Now f itself can be uh, you know quite a broad range of types of functions. In general, this is nonlinear. And as, as simple as this thing looks, right, and there's typically associated with it uh, an initial condition. So we would start off some initial condition, evolve it forward with this set of equations, which basically tells you some relationship through F between how this quantity is changing in time related to the function itself and maybe it's time dependent. So generically, this could be nonlinear time invariant. And what we want to do is uh, start simplifying this. But initially, you know, this is typically almost all of our science is represented in calculus-based metrics, right? In other words, how system changes in time, we think about deriving governing equations for that system, which tells us relationship between derivatives in order for us to express how these quantities change and evolve, okay? So f equals ma is a version of this, which tells us how the second derivative of space is basically proportional to the force. So these are important relationships, and this is how we've built most of our engineering and physics-based models is based on these calculus-based rules. Okay, so let's talk about some of the solution techniques for this. In general, we don't know how to solve this equation. So unless we have very specific forms of f, we might be able to solve it. But what we're going to assume is we're going to move it to, to an LTI system, linear time invariant system. So first of all, f now is going to be linear. And second of all, that time dependence is going to disappear. So here it is. LTI systems, this is for one dimensional, dy dt equals ay. It's a very simple linear model. It's the simplest one you can construct. More broadly, if y is a vector, in other words, a system of differential equations, this is what it's going to look like. dy dt equals matrix A y. So, you know, this is a very simplified one-dimensional version. This is an n-dimensional system of differential equations that we might want to solve. Okay, so we're moving away from this general solution here where we don't have... Uh, arbitrary techniques or general solution forms unless we know specifically what f is. We, in fact, we oftentimes, if this is nonlinear or time dependent, we would just solve this numerically. But here, these linear systems, they're time invariant, and we can solve them explicitly. And how are we going to do it? So these linear ODEs, we're going to actually just put in exponential solutions. So remember, exponentials are going to be the basis for all of this linear modeling. In particular, there's one type of exponential we're most interested in, exponentials with purely imaginary parts. In other words, these turn into cosines and sines, signals that persist over a long period of time. Okay, Because if you have exponential with a positive real part, it goes to infinity, or if a negative real part, it goes to zero. And what we're going to consider are signals primarily that we have imaginary or purely imaginary eigenvalues. So here's your solution either in 1D or n dimensions, or those are the differential equations, linear time invariant differential equations. And what we're going to do is just, this is the one technique that you have available to you for solving differential equations, plug in an exponential. So for this one here, you just plug in some constant c, e to lambda t. For this one here, y, you say it's some vector v times e to lambda t. So this e to lambda t is where all the time dependence is. The nice thing is you only have to take one derivative of this, right? So one derivative of this is, well, this is the only place where time shows up. The derivative of e to lambda t is lambda e to lambda t. Same thing here. So 
trivial time dependence, trivial differentiation, which leads you to these solutions. So in the first case, it's pretty easy. Lambda is equal to A. So right away, you know very much about the solution because if you know what that constant A is, the solution is E to the AT. So if, that's a, if A is positive and real, then your solution is going to blow up. If A is a purely complex number, purely imaginary, then these are going to be sines and cosines. And if you look at here in the systems case, if you plug in this into here, you take the derivative, you end up with an eigenvalue problem. So the eigenvalues of this now determine the behavior of the system because it's E to that eigenvalue T. So again, positive and real parts either blow up or go to zero, and the imaginary components, uh, they oscillate, producing sines and cosines. So a lot of what we'll consider in this class is going to reduce down to very simple second order LTI systems, which is here is the generic version of it, which is it's a second order differential equation with constant coefficient. So it's, it's time invariant because the coefficients are all time independent. They're just constants. Uh, it's linear because we only have a relationship between second derivative, first derivative, uh, and the function itself, but they're not multiplying each other to produce nonlinear uh, non functions. And here we're going to add some function ft on the right-hand side. So we have a differential equation driven by some f of t. So let's talk about how to actually construct solutions to this. So if you've had differential equations, then you will hopefully know what you're going to do with this, which is when you construct solutions to second-order equations that's non-homogeneous, so you have this term on the right, then solutions are constructed in the following way. Your generic solution for this is the homogeneous solutions plus a particular solution. Okay, So the particular solution, homogeneous solutions, you get them in different ways. The homogeneous solutions, really easy to construct. It's you're going to just set this f of t to 0 and then find a solution. So how do you do that? The homogeneous solution, here it is. You set the right-hand side to 0. So this is the homogeneous solution. It just satisfies a linear constant coefficient second-order differential equation. And as I just showed you, your go-to technique in this is just try an exponential solution. For the linear problems, it's exactly what you're always going to be doing. So you just throw in e to the lambda t, and what you end up with is a quadratic equation. So you differentiate that. Second derivative push, pushes down at lambda squared. First derivative pushes down at lambda. And so what you end up here is a quadratic equation for lambda. And lambda, remember, is going to characterize all the behavior in time that the system can produce. Okay. I'm assuming you know how to solve the quadratic equation, so you just find the roots of that, and that quadratic equation will tell you everything about this system. So, what about the particular solution? The particular solution is a solution that you are looking for that actually satisfies this f of t here. So, what you normally do to get the particular solution is you say, oh, what if f of t is a cosine of 3t? So, what you triply try to do is trying to find some particular solution that might be able to produce a cosine 3t out the back end, which probably means you try a solution that looks like, how about if we try a solution that looks like cosine 3t or sine 3t? These are the kind of solutions that actually can produce cosines and sines of 3t. So you guess a solution of that form, and then once you find that, I'm not going to talk too much about, uh, too much about this, um, let me just, okay. And, but I, I will say that all you have to do now is linear superimpose it. So you take your homogeneous, your in particular, your linear superimpose, and then your solution to this. Okay? So, again, partly what's assumed here is you have some small, some small amount of differential equations knowledge. But even if you don't, here's your trick. We just learned how to solve differential equations, at least for the ones that we're interested in, these LTI ones, which are linear time invariant, you're just going to plug in an exponential. Okay? All right. So uh, we can also take the second order linear time invariant system and turn it into a system of first order equations. So that's also commonly done. So you can take, in fact, you can take an nth order equation and turn it into n first order equations. And this is how you do it. So for the second order equation here, you would just simply say, I take a new variable, call it y1 is equal to y, and y2 
is dy dt. So now I have two new variables, y1 and y2. And what I do is, with that new two new variables, y1 and y2, I say, well, look, look at this equation. So first of all, the derivative of y1, dy1 dt, is dy dt, but that's y2. So I have this relationship right here. dy1 dt is equal to y2. That's one of the equations I have. And then if I took the derivative of dy2 dt, it's the second derivative of dy dt, or d, uh, sorry, it's the second derivative of y, which by the way, is given right here. D, second derivative of y is just this guy here, which it's related to the first derivative of y itself. So I could actually rewrite dy dt is, I can solve here for the second derivative, divide by a, take those to the other side, and this is what I get here, where I've replaced y2, which is exactly this term, and that's y1. So I've written everything now in terms of y1 and y2, or another way to write this is a system like this, where the matrix A is exactly this. So you can always choose to either work with a differential equation, which is higher order, a second order differential equation, or turn it into two first order equations. And oftentimes this is actually what's done in practice, is you write it as a system of equations. So at the end of the day, we're often thinking about systems that are x dot equals a of x. That's how we're gonna typically write our linear system is in that form. Okay, and so that matrix A, all we wanna do is calculate its eigenvalues, and once we have its eigenvalues, we know everything about the behavior of that system. Okay, so that becomes really important for us in this LTI framework. All right, so how do we get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this? Well, you just, uh, you know, basically what you're looking at is A minus lambda I. You take the determinant, equal to zero, and again, you get the quadratic equation, okay? So I'm assuming you know how to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix A, and again, results in the same quadratic equation we had before is if I just tried to put in an exponential solution. So that's sort of a, a real basic overview or reminder, hopefully, of how to solve these simple differential equations. I wanna come back now to thinking about this in the context of these signal processing systems where we think about block diagrams. And now I can think about writing down differential equations. So let's consider one here. First derivative plus ay is bx. So it's being forced by bx and I'm trying to solve for y. And this has a very nice representation in terms of block diagrams. So I can rewrite this, solve for y. So I'm gonna to try to solve for y here. So it means move that first derivative over. So I get minus dy dt and then divide by a, right? I have an a in front divided by it and this is what I get here. So once I've written it in this form, the way you would normally do this with a block diagram is you'd say, okay, first of all, there's three operations I'm gonna be interested in. Notice what I have here. I'm gonna have addition of signals, right? I'm gonna have a division by a constant, and then I'm also going to have a derivative of this signal. And so this is how they're represented in block diagram form. So the addition of two signals is given by this little juncture here with the plus sign. So x1, x2 is just the two signals together. Multiplication, you just put the multiplier there. So if I take a signal, multiply by a, that's what I get. And then this is a differentiator, which is you just put a d in there. That represents the operation of differentiation. Okay, so with these three basic blocks, I'm gonna come back and look at this now and represent it in terms of block diagram. And this is what you get. So the block diagram, again, start with this equation I just wrote down, take in the signal x of a, x here. And by the way, the x is multiplied by e, b over a. So there it is. So that is a scaling factor. And what I'm doing with this signal, I'm adding the derivative. So out of this, I'm getting some y here. I'm looking at y, but y itself gets differentiated and gets recombined with that b over a with a factor of negative one over a. So you see what this does. I have this output y, but really I combine into y the derivative times the scaling factor of one, minus one over a. So this is a block diagram representation of this simple differential equation. So these block diagrams become important because essentially, in some sense, when you do signal processing, 
one of the things you might draw in that, you're going to try to do control of a lot of these signals that you're going to process. And block diagrams are a natural framework in which to construct sort of this, this, this sort of vision of how you would think about the signal being processed and how you might want to control it. Okay, And in this case here, this differentiation loop that coming back here is, looks like a feedback into this system here, which is a simple differential equation. So overall, we're going to have to solve differential equations generically. But what I just showed you is you're just going to plug in exponentials. That's it. So that's the main trick that you're going to be using to solve differential equations. So just keep that in mind. Remember, most of the signal processing, what we're interested in is not only, you know, exponentials are solutions to these differential equations, but really what we're interested in these exponentials with purely imaginary parts, which are going to turn them into cosines and sines in their behavior. Of course, you could have signals that have real parts that are positive or negative, and more likely when you're solving the systems, when you kick it and there's a response, you're looking maybe for oscillations and the real part to be negative so that the solution that these responses decay over time. So that if the response decays over time, then you integrate over, over that to get your overall response, y of t, to a system. So this starts to set up the mathematical framing of that, and we're going to use differential equations uh, quite a bit as we go forward in modeling many of the systems uh, of interest that come in engineering, including circuits. Um, well, almost everything's modeled by differential equations because it's physics-based models that tells us about relationships between derivatives. So we'll be doing a lot of that in, in what happens and comes up. Thank you.